Hi, this is Lamar, and you're listening to Getting to Third Space with Lamar and Tom. Getting to Third Space is produced by Tenacious Change, a consultancy committed to creating resilient nonprofit organizations. This podcast is available on Spotify, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, and Apple Podcasts. Wherever you listen to Getting to Third Space with Lamar and Tom, be sure to subscribe to hear about new episodes when they become available. Also, be sure to share this podcast with friends, colleagues, and family. The more people join us, the quicker we get to third space as a society. Hey, Lamar, how you doing today? Hey, doing well, Tom. How about you? Well, Staying warm out there? Oh, no. It's, <laughs> it's, it, is, it is a miserable day here in, oh in Maryland. Gosh. It has been raining cats and dogs all day and blowing like crazy and it's cold i mean we can look out our window and we and we and really it's actually flooding yards it's oh it's been very intense i understand you've had just delightful weather today too though <laughs> yeah, in fact we had to reschedule this so i could get the rest of my driveway shoveled so we we get about i haven't heard officially but on my yard it's about seven inches of, of snow overnight and um and, and my wife, who has clients who come to the house, um, needed a place to park. And so so I've been out shoveling snow most of the morning. So uh, does that mean you have a snow blower on your list for uh, later this year? <laughs> no. I mean, this happens so rarely in Kansas that, uh, you know, I wouldn't know where to put it. But I, I got to tell you, though, there were people out with snow blowers. I don't know where they brought them from, but they, <laughs> they have them. But but living in a small community, you get to know people, and that's really kind of cool during a time like this. Yeah. Um, because my uh, neighbor, two or three houses down, came by with a skid steer, and he said, "Hey, you want me to get the um, uh, the entryway to your uh, to your driveway cleaned out? You know, like where all the snow plows push everything." Yeah. I said, "Absolutely." So he had that all cleaned out. So uh, you know. Thanks to Mike uh, for taking taking the time to uh, to clean out the front part of my uh, driveway. That was great. Oh, that is, that is really really nice. I remember a snowstorm so bad in Iowa one year that um, all the highways around me were down to one lane. Oh my, yeah. And and uh, and with really high drifts, it it was just it was a it was amazing. I don't know how. How people actually got, I mean, you really cared about your neighbor in that moment because you couldn't go flying down the highway because you might go around a curve and boom, you know, there somebody is. So it, it was, it was amazing to see just how cautiously people navigated, uh, in that, in that kind of situation. You know, living in Iowa, people, uh, we were much more used to this kind of weather. Yeah. Uh, had it more often, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> than here in Kansas. So when it snows here, it's like, I don't want to go out on the roads. I'm comfortable being on the roads myself, but yeah. I see what other people are doing who are not used to it. And so I would rather just kind of let them take a day or two to get used to it. Wait, well, Lamar, you remember uh, Driver's Ed in Iowa? They taught us how mm -hmm. to drive on this stuff. And they taught Absolutely. us how to drive on snow and ice and in, in water and, mm -hmm. and, and so when I moved to uh, the East Coast, I, I just figured, well, it's not a big deal. I'm just going to get you know, six inches of snow, not a thing. I go out there, and, and I, what I realized was it's not about whether I could drive in it. It's about whether anybody else can drive in it. Absolutely. And the answer to that was, no, not many. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so the safest thing to do is just to stay in. <laughs> that's right. That's yeah. for for the first day or two. Let everyone get acclimated to it. Absolutely. But I do Absolutely. have to tell you though. I got my exercise in for today and good maybe tomorrow. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so we're good. Excellent. Well, actually, if you can't move tomorrow, you know you got your exercise that's in right. for these two days, right? So, that's right. Well, I suppose we ought to get to it because um, we just uh, finished up uh, our last podcast was part one. Uh, mm -hmm. with Seth Kaplan. And today's podcast uh, features part two of what was nearly a 90-minute conversation we had with Seth. Wow. And um, our, our listeners will remember that Seth Kaplan is a leading expert on what is known as fragile states. He's also the author of Fragile Neighborhoods, Repairing American so Society, One Zip Code at a Time. Now, in part one, 
we talked a lot about the concepts of fragile states and fragile neighborhoods. In this segment, in part two, we shifted the conversation and focused more on civil dialogue and conversation and its relationship to strengthening fragile states and fragile neighborhoods. So, Lamar, I was just thinking about this um, a little while ago, but before we get into part two of the interview, what if we reflected just a bit on our takeaways from part one? Um, Go ahead. Yeah, and I think uh, I mean you set it up well in that um, part two is kind of where we get into where the work that you and I have been doing together kind of intersects with the work that um, you know Seth has been doing and that he's been writing about. You know the the civil dialogue and then how building relationships um, uh, impact uh, the kind of work that the, the folks that he re- he. Re- refers to. So one of the questions that we had and that he was answering uh, quite well was, you know, what, how do you strengthen neighborhoods that are fragile? Um, You know, neighborhoods that maybe don't have um, the connectedness. Um, And I think that was a lot of what he talked about. Um, Just like I had a guy down the street, came with his skid steer to, to, to take care of the front part of my uh, driveway. But if you don't have that, I would probably still be out there uh, and maybe not even able to get in out of my driveway for a day or so. But how how do you strengthen the fragile neighborhoods? And I thought that uh, when he was exploring that, that was very helpful to me. Uh, building relationships as we're going to be talking about this second half, but but also what's missing. You know, the uh, I think in my mind, kind of the corner store or the shopkeeper that knows the kids, or uh, in his example is where do you take your child when they're injured? Well, run down the street to the nurse. Uh, There's seven of them who live within the same neighborhood. Um, You know, so I I think that uh, just learning how to be interdependent, learning how to live together in a, in a neighborhood and, and know who's who. He talked about knowing who lives behind the doors in your neighborhood. I thought that was a really good visual for me. So I, I found a lot of real, really helpful uh, descriptions that, that Seth was giving us in part one. Yeah. 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 You know, and, and you, you talked about that interdependence. And I think when I, when I reflect on, on what I heard in that, uh, in that first part uh, of the, uh, of the interview, uh, there are actually a couple quotes that I, I went back and I grabbed. Uh, one was, I, at least I think they're quotes. They're, it's really close anyway. Uh, when you live in a place where there are relationships and norms, he said, there's a sense of willful interdependence brought about by lots of interactions. And the thing that really grabbed me about that, and you re- you referenced the inter- interdependence, and you gave an example of that. But, you know, there there's a quality of that that has to be willful. You have to be willing right. to make yourself interdependent with other people or to, and to allow other people to reach out to you. Uh, and that, that, that mutuality of dependence is, is so critical, but it has to be an intentional and willful thing that takes place. The other quote that, that I heard, uh, and then I, I went back and I grabbed is if you are involved, you are without even thinking about it building trust. And this really came out of that portion where we were talking about how you go about building trust in relationships, or maybe it was even when we were talking about when nonprofits, how do they go about building trust? And he emphasized this idea that if you're just simply involved with other people, That's without right. even being aware of it, you're actually building trust between yourself and that other person. Those were two real gems that I took away from from that uh, that particular segment of the podcast, it was packed full of gems. Uh, you know, Seth Kaplan has a way of uh, he doesn't he doesn't waste a lot of words. No, <laughs> he doesn't. He shares a lot of great ideas. So yeah. I, I think we're ready for part two, don't you think? I think so. I think yeah. so. So, and, um, and if you if, if the listener hasn't you as a listener haven't listened yet to part one. Uh, you don't necessarily need to listen to that before uh, part two. However, you are going to want to go back and take an opportunity to to listen to part one as soon as you have that opportunity to do so and to kind of digest that information. And it'll probably have a – it'll be a nice uh, complement 
to uh, this part two section that we're just getting ready to uh, to put out there. So for now, here's part two of our conversation with Seth Kaplan. So to put you on the spot just a little bit, um, Seth, uh, what is the single most important thing that Tom or I as individuals can do to build trust with people? Uh, you're talking about people you've never met before. Yes. Um, I would say the most important thing is spend time with them. Um, that might mean over food. When I in my in my business, a lot of what we do is involves meals, drinking. Uh, doesn't mean ending up on the floors or anything like that, but it's <laughs> it's basically lubricating relationships so that people have a sense that of camaraderie, fraternity, and and um, I mean. I run brain trusts. I run something called practice groups. And a, a lot of that is just finding ways for people to feel that they're, they have a sense of ownership. They have a sense of it's giving people the say in what we do and so on and so forth. But I would say that um, I would say spending time with people, um, showing up over and over again, it really helps to show up over and over again. The first few times you show up, people may not trust you. But if you show up over and over again, if you really want to build trust, move into their neighborhood. They may not trust you initially, but that would be a sign that you have. Uh, I mean, you, you basically have to show up over and over again. You have to um, talk to them many times. The fact that you are physically there can make a huge difference. Uh, the the more the relationship is built before any any type of transaction is is. Um, is um is undertaken very important well seth we're go we're going to pivot just a little bit uh, and talk about your your experience with civil conversations and even what your work may tell us about civil conversations and and uh, and their role um so in your opinion what makes one conversation civil and another not it depends a little bit on what you're doing, where you're doing it. I would expect people in a meeting room to speak to be have a different relationship than they were if they're having dinner together. Um and I would expect people who had spent um a long time in violent conflict to behave differently than you might speak to your neighbor. I hate to use these extreme examples, but um my one, not me personally, but one of my colleagues uh, was involved in the negotiations to end the uh, war in Colombia, and and the negotiations. The, the teams would meet for two weeks in Havana, Cuba, and then they'd have a week off, and they would go back and forth. And I and he was one of the nine people on the government side, with the nine people on the FARC side. I think this what that conversation was like was quite different than what than what you might try to accomplish with your neighbor. But I would say in general, it's the language, the openness, the body language. Um, uh, that the fact is, are other people doing things that make you put your guard down or that make you lift your guard up? I would say all of those things are important. If you're speaking in a way that encourages the other person to be defensive, then I think something is problematic. But I would also put on a different level that um, if you wanted to take a deeper answer, I would say one of the problems we have in our society, and I see this in my work in um, working on depolarization in many countries, is that people can think they're being civil and they can do everything they can sort of follow a set of rules of what it means to be civil, but simply by the type of topic they choose, that in itself can be viewed as uncivil. Um, I I know people who are, I, I don't want to pick on um, on a particular side, but I know people who work on depolarization and at the same time they're working on promoting certain values. And those things don't, um, and those values aren't like basic morality, thou shall not kill. I mean, they're, they're values that the, another side 
in the debate might view as an attack on their values. So I, I, to have a civic conversation, it doesn't mean you're not going to get deep into debates on different contentious issues. But I think people need to be have a, an incredible level of self-awareness to understand that simply the type of topics, the type of words they use can be perceived as uncivil and polarizing to the other side. And I can, I can actually see people who are peacekeeping, peacekeeping, but mostly they come from one side in a country. And unless they're trained to think about like narratives and language, they're unaware of how their subconscious biases basically make their, make their, make them ineffective in their work or ineffective in their work. So I, I would say to be properly civil, you really need to get deep on many of these levels. Again, it depends if what you're doing. If you're talking about borrowing milk, it's different than having a conversation on some of these different polarizing issues. I, I think your your point is a really good one. And, I, and I'm thinking about this particularly in the context of conversations that people have over um, culture war issues, because that's those are the, the kinds of issues that the people try to come together and talk about, and yet one side or the other or both sides perceive the other side as really attacking them at at a level of their core values, and and I think that's what part of what makes it so very very difficult for us to have really good conversations and useful conversations around some of these culture war topics but but i'm i'm wondering how do you how do you i, I think if ahead. i may interject tom i think the challenge is, is that people have turned values into like their moral fundamental the fundamental moral worldview and they're unaware of just how they speak can be a turn off to other people and so having a it's i think it's okay to debate these issues but people really need to, if they really want to be civil, they need to step out of their, some of their biases. And again, this is complicated because there are fundamental moral issues that, that, that I don't think are, you can compromise on. But, but there are culture war issues that people feel they can't compromise on that they need to at least put aside. They may not change their opinion, but they need to put aside and um, if they're ever going to have a civil civic conversation with uh, another person from another side. Good point. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for uh, uh, picking up on that. Um, thinking about the, the, your work in fragile neighborhoods, I'm going to assume, uh, but you can certainly correct me here, that, that there is a, an important role that civil dialogue plays in 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 repairing uh, the fragile neighborhoods in American society, um, is, is that correct? Uh, can you say more about that? If if or or say no, Tom, you know, you missed it. So so I I think we can think about this on two levels. One is I believe neighborhoods creating flourishing neighborhoods is an issue that people on the left and right can all agree upon. From my experience in the last year, I see a lot of interest and a lot of support for the basic idea that flourishing neighborhoods is a very nice, very important issue that people on both sides of the political spectrum can get around. Um, they, they use different language. Uh, the left seems to be a little bit focused on the material. The right seems to be more focused on the social dynamics and so on and so forth. But so on one level, I think um, having a discourse from with people from different political backgrounds on how to improve a neighborhood or how to improve all neighborhoods across the country is something that can help promote bipartisanship or postpartisanship or civil discourse around questions about how to improve our society. These are things, the approaches might be different at times, but the basic end goal is something that I think can and can. So that's one level. I think it can reduce the tensions 
by having some sort of common North Star. I think on a, on a second level, when we focus on the local and the practical, it tends to disarm some of the polarization because the polarization tends to be about very abstract and distant goals. And the more we're focused on making improvements in our streets, in our local institutions, in our schools, in our neighborhoods and things that make neighborhoods more successful, I think it's something that, again, brings people together on a very personal basis. Um, in terms of working with neighbors, an ideal neighborhood should be cross-class and cross-politics. So if you live in a good neighborhood, ideally, you should be very comfortable speaking with and you should have an abundance of people from uh, the opposite political persuasion. If you live in a place and everyone has the same politics as you, I'm thinking either that's that's very homogeneous and that's that's not as healthy a neighborhood as it could be, or I'm also thinking there's probably more people in that neighborhood who disagree with you but are afraid to talk about it and therefore there's a lack of civil discourse and um, and so I would say I live in a neighborhood where there are a certain amount of Democrats and there's a certain amount of Republicans and there's a certain amount of people who don't want to talk politics and we have we have everything and it just it just it's I think it's healthier and so a, a strong neighborhood should be politically diverse it should be class diverse it should these multiple diversities. You need something to bring people together. And that's when I talk about all the institutions and the, and the physical. But I would certainly think the more we're able to cooperate and talk with people and do things practically locally, the better our civil discourse will be locally and nationally. Seth, in, in that same vein, without using names or identifying information, of course, can you tell us about a difficult conversation you had with someone, but were able to main uh, to maintain that civility? Can you give us an example of what what you have been sharing? Can I talk about my five year old or something? Yeah, like that? <laughs> I would Your say, choice. and I, I have to say that um, the hardest place it's so much easier to remain civil when it's not my kids. So um, I would say, <laughs> I would say it's <laughs> I would Fair. say. I would say um, much easier trying to deal with ethnic ten or religious tensions in Nigeria than try to get uh, be civil when my son is taking about three hours to get out of the house in the morning <laughs> and my and my daughter is smacking him because he's uh, not not doing something that he's why she have to my daughter is eleven but she actually she's the mother all the time to her her younger brother. Um, I mean, so I, I would just say, I don't know if that's a good example, but I would say if if you can learn to remain civil, and I, I have to remind myself almost every day, if th these kids are training me to be, remain civil in the, my life, and I'm failing. So I would say there's, there's no better training than having to be a parent, um, especially if your kids are just by, I mean, I was the same way. It must be in the genes. They're... Um, they're like uh, very good at not listening, doing their own thing. I mean, I meet some kids. I'm like, these kids, how do they listen? They certainly don't come from my family. So um, I would say the best training house is trying to remain civil and uh, with your family. So I, I don't know if that's what you wanted, but I would say that's easily by far and away the hardest conversations I have is uh, is in my house every single day. It's great training. And I'm mostly failing, but I'm trying my best. <laughs> well, you know, I think though you you raise a a point that a lot of us do have to to kind of face, um, it, not just necessarily with our children, but also with uh, our families and extended families, because we're in close relationship with people we care deeply about, but we may have very different perspectives on things that are important to us. And being able to have a civil conversation in those high high stakes relationships is important as well. Uh, those kind of tools that we've talked about in the past here on this podcast of of how do you listen, how do you how do you show respect, etc., come into play and are very important. How do you yeah, know? Yeah. Go. I'm sorry. Uh, how do you no, know I was, in these I was, roles that you're successful? Yeah. 
Um, how do you know if it's successful? I, I would say if I may give a different, a, a larger example, I would say, I would say one of the more uncomfortable, if I think about engaging with people, I tend to not want to be, not want to provoke conflict. So I can think of lots of conversations where people were saying things, whether it was because of cultural issues or political issues that I did not agree with. And yet I just basically swallowed my tongue and says, it's not important that we have a disagreement. It's not important for me to voice my opinion. And I just want to, I mean, I have neighbors. I'm a big fan of not putting statements on my bumper sticker of my car and not putting statements on my front lawn. And believe me, I have a lot of issues I care a lot about. And I keep thinking, would I at least put an American flag up? But I even think that at times is um, contentious at some level to some people. And so I just, we, I have nothing. I Anything we might have is inside the house and nothing, you can't even tell um, anything identifying who we are. So I, I'm of, I think if you're in your neighborhood, um, you would you would be doing your best to just promote good relationships away from these issues. And um, if there's people who talk a bit too much about it, um, I would be tempted to, on a very personal basis, just ask the person to um, put some of these aside so that we have better better relationships, better cohesion. Um, I mean, that's how I would tend to view the, some of these things. I'm not sure it's exactly the answer that you would want, but I, I'm a fan of relationships first and politics and other things that will divide us, putting them aside when we can. So Seth, I, I had um, um, a question for you that, but I think maybe you've already answered this in an earlier uh but but I do want to give you an opportunity to maybe expand upon it just a little bit if if you're so inclined. Because right now, as we enter 2024, uh, there is a lot of concern that people have about the state of our democracy. There's a lot of concern that people have about what could be happening over the next next uh, few months and uh, in, in the political arena. And and so what, what thoughts do you have about um the role that civil conversation plays in a democracy and in fact, perhaps preserving a democracy. I mean, I think um, for the reasons that you allude to, this will not be an easy year for uh, many people, partly because they will be very anxious. I can, I know a lot of people that will be anxious about this election and um, in a highly functioning highly democratic society. This is an extremely democratic society. We need to think of society as opposed to, I mean, I think we have a decay in our civic institutions over the last two generations, yet we still remain very democratic as people. And I do think there's a great need to boost our daily, the daily institutions we interact with that allow us to have relationships with people on many levels outside of politics and that will make politics healthier. And I think one of the reasons why we have anxiety is because uh, our declining connectiveness has led um, to greater alienation, greater anger, greater polarization, and that affects politics in many, many ways. But in terms of what you say, I mean, again, it depends on where people live. I mean, it, it's so much of our country, people seem to live in places where everyone votes a certain way or the other way. And I would say the most important thing that we can be doing is um, just maintaining dialogue with people, trying to understand their perspective, trying to get into their shoes. When I travel to a country or when I travel to America, basically, when I did my research uh, for fragile neighborhoods, I always try to see things the way other people see things. I try to, I did homestays. I read books that the authors from those places would write. Um, I go visit different places, different 
um, parts, um, talk to lots of people, whether it's taxi cab drivers or uh, people on the street, people in the restaurant and um, everywhere. Talk about their history, their lives, um, their journey, their feelings. Politics is at the at, at best the end of the conversation, not, never the beginning. But I would say the more we're intentional, there's things that used to happen without us being intentional, but because of the decay of our civic institutions, I think we need to be much more intentional about making relationships with our neighbors. We need to be much more intentional about being engaged with people from different political backgrounds to the extent that we're able to do that and have healthy conversations. Um, I just think that we will be, will be, will be more understanding. We'll be less angry and we will be more likely to have the, if everybody did that, which is a big ask given that not everyone is listening to us here, but the more we're able to have these bridging institutions and bridging relationships, I just think we're, we'll have, we'll have stronger shock absorbers and we'll be less anxious and we'll, we'll feel, um, we'll feel more comfortable with whatever the year brings us. Seth, you've graciously allowed us to quiz you and you've answered our questions and more than answered our questions. We very much appreciate that. What kind of questions might you have for Tom and I? <laughs> okay, that's a curveball. So I appreciate <laughs> that very much. So I would say, I would. I think one of my bigger questions, I, I think I'm always asking people, when you do this podcast or you do your daily work, what kind of theory of change? I mean, again, if we just think of the podcast, um, what do you expect listeners or viewers to do differently? And how do they mass, how do they multiply those efforts to other people? But you could also answer this question in terms of your work. How, where do you see that you have the biggest value add? And how do you see that value add leading to, I would say, cascading because we're really what we're we're in the business of doing incremental steps that have cascading effects. So I would ask you how, how you think about those things. Wow, that's I'll that's that's a, that's a that, really Tom. that's really easy. Of course, no. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent question. Thanks, Seth. I so, could Lamar, give you, you a harder question if you want. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, no, I've already I've already done the dissertation work. I'm good. So uh, uh, go, go, go ahead, Lamar. Sure. You know, um, I've spent most of my career working with uh, individuals and large groups of people and working communities, uh, helping people solve problems um, and working through some of the, the experiences that they've had. At this side of my working career, I'm finding it valuable to be to become more involved in my community and looking at some of the challenges that maybe we have have to face that's not an easy task i even when i was in the working world it, it now it, it's kind of a different task you have to build that trust you have to rebuild some of those relationships again i'm finding this podcast has been a good exercise one for me to begin to organize uh, more of my my work outside of my relationships outside of the podcast, but I'm finding that locally the podcast having impact as, as, as the listeners who are more local that I'm aware of are using some of these techniques in, in some of the problem solving and some of the, the group kind of dynamics that they're involved in. I'm hoping that by, by broadcasting and those who are listening, uh, uh, who are not necessarily local are also finding the same kinds of tools and and maybe strategies that they can play that they can put in place in their areas. Just just like what what you're doing at a much larger scale, I'm hoping that what we're doing can have some impact as people begin to build relationships and solve difficult problems and have good communication. So it's it's all of that, both at a very local um, relational level here for me. And what I see and hope is happening for other listeners. 
you, you know, I was really intrigued by your use of the of the of the word in your question of the theory of change. You know, what's our what's our theory of change? Uh, unlike Lamar, uh, I am still working, and uh, um, in fact, this doing this podcast is part of that work that I do in in, in my small business, my small consulting business, and. The theory of change, it's such an interesting way to ask that question, Seth. The theory of change for me is, is very closely aligned with, with what you talk about in fragile neighborhoods. Uh, for years, I have believed that the, that there is something that is very significant that happens in relationships between people and that the degree to which I am able to act with integrity and and um and be in relationship with somebody that is positive and is um is is helpful and is uh um and is is toward the greater good is the degree to which i'm hoping that they will take that same experience and pay that forward at an individual level and perhaps even at a at an organizational level level and so that's a uh, that's been very much a part of of uh, of of my work for the last several years like you i did some research into this uh and uh and i find myself uh coming back again and again to these core ideas of trust and and respect and and integrity uh, as really being cornerstones uh of of being a a really healthy relationship with people and the degree to which we have those you know we we have a good relationship with people and between institutions so my hope is that uh at least in in my very small corner of the world in which i work and live that i'm able to to make that kind of impact uh, at an individual level with people that they then pay it forward and carry it forward into in their lives and in their work as well. That's my hope. And by the way, have I done all of that perfectly? Absolutely not. Ab and Lamar knows that better than most folks. Uh, I've not been perfect in, in doing that, but uh, it's a little bit like ballroom dancing and golf. Um, <laughs> you, you, you never do it perfectly, right? You're, there's you're no always, perfection in the real world. Let's put it that no way, There's no perfection Tom. in the real world. You're always just trying to do it a little bit yeah, better. Yeah, there's nothing, there's nothing um, there's, unless you're doing, um, I guess if you have a multiple choice test or something, you could get a perfect <laughs> score. But mostly for real, real work, there's no perfection. There's even relationships. No one is perfect at it. Yeah, yeah. Well... Seth, we really, really appreciate you being with us today, and uh, we'd love to have you come back in the future. Uh, at, at any time, you just feel like you want to chat, just let me know, <laughs> and and we'll uh, we'll 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 put you into the podcast, and we'll just chat away. But uh, we've really covered a lot today, and, and I'm I'm glad that we are able to dig a little bit deeper into the concept of fragile states, and into uh, the the basic ideas uh, within your book, Fragile Neighborhoods. And and I just want to say to folks that are listening, if you haven't picked up a copy of Fragile Neighborhoods, please do so. It's not going to break your bank. It's a very reasonably priced book, and it is, it's going to make you think. It's going to make you think about uh, where you live, about the relationships that you have with people, and, and how you can improve those relationships and, and, and really create a, 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 a better place to live for everybody to heal uh, your neighborhood if, in fact, it is fragile or broken. And certainly, all of this goes to making our, our country a better place in a year that promises to be or maybe threatens to be uh, a rather challenging time for us. So, Seth, thank you very, very much. We just really appreciate it. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Lamar. So, so much appreciate this. Thank you. Well, you know, we have really enjoyed having Seth Kaplan on the podcast, and we hope you did too. Um, I had to laugh when he talked about the challenges of communicating <laughs> with civility with his five-year-old son. <laughs> right. Oh, my gosh. You know, we, we've all been there with family members, right? Whether we have children or or that uh, that uncle or that aunt or, or even our parents that, that we just sometimes we got to kind of, you know, grit our teeth and get through it. Um, otherwise, you, you know, we may lose it. Um, I'm, I'm really hoping that we can get Seth back sometime in the future. Yeah. Um, Lamar, 
So do you want to tip folks off to what we are considering considering for our next podcast? Sure. Um, you know, we, we've heard from our listeners that having guests um, has been a, a valuable, not kind of a nice change and also kind of expanding the, the thoughts and the perspectives of that, that we're going for on this, uh, on this podcast. And that's been great, but strangely, um, they also would like to hear more from us. <laughs> so, um, you know, our next podcast is it, we're going back again. It's going to be just the two of us. Um, we're going to talk about, uh, you know, we've been talking about getting to third space and this is so, so much the center of what, uh, this podcast is about. Um, but we're going to talk about, you know, is it, we're going to explore the idea, is it sustainable to stay in this space? Um, and are there other spaces that um, we need to think about? Uh, and and what are those other spaces and how do they relate to third space? And, um, you know, you know, we're going to be following uh, this up with some other guests as well. Uh, but, Tom, maybe you could talk about what the other guests are. But next time, it's going to be you and I talking about third space and some other spaces that complement third space. Yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to that conversation. We've we've kind of kicked that can around a little bit, we and uh, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun for us to do that as part of the podcast. But uh, so um, after that, we're going to be reaching way over the great Atlantic pond to the United Kingdom to a guy by the name of Ed Schrager. Now. Ed works with charities in the UK, uh, what we would call nonprofits here in the US. And part of his work is focused on, on building relationships between people in the workplace that are authentic and genuine. And in, in fact, he created a platform known as King Prawn to help organizations do that with the workforce. And, and I've actually participated in some King Prawn conversations mm. that he set up and I love them. They're just, they're, it's really great to get to know people from other parts of the country, other parts of the world. And Ed is also very much into artificial intelligence as well. And so we're going to tap into his expertise with AI to have a conversation about reality <laughs> and how do we know when a source of information is truthful right. and valid. Um, something that at least right now and the last past few years has been uh, one of those topics that's right. uh, one of those issues that's made it really challenging for people to come together and have civil conversations is when they they have two different perspectives on what is real and what is truthful. Yeah. And you and I have talked about this on a number of occasions um, and that, you know, we, we all kind of have our favorite places to go to, uh, to get information. And sometimes, uh, you know, we find ourselves just kind of uh, building our own biases based off where we go. And so how do we know where else to go and where good resources are? I think this will be the beginning of another good conversation. Um, I think it's one of those that we, we might return to more than once. Uh, Plus, Ed has a great British accent, I just want to say. <laughs> so remember, we try to be responsive to suggestions that you might have as listeners. Uh, however, we do need to hear from you. Uh, there are a couple of different ways that you can be in touch with us. Uh, first of all, you can leave us a voice message on Spotify, uh, which is hosting this podcast. And of course, we both have emails. And uh, you can contact us on the emails. Mine is lamar.thirdspace at gmail.com. And Tom's is tom.thirdspace at gmail.com. Uh, not a whole lot of difference except our first names. You'll find, if you're watching this on the YouTube channel, you'll find these uh, at the bottom of the uh, page. Otherwise, um, please write that down and send us a note if you have comments, suggestions, if you want to like us on the uh, podcast, that's always helpful, or to leave a comment, we would appreciate it. Remember, third space is spelled with the number three. Yes, indeed. And uh, you also, if you're if you're listening, um, you'll find it in the show notes as well. So it's, it's down there too. So, well, Lamar, we got weather issues we got to deal with in our in our individual spaces. I can't get my dog to go out. I can't get my dog to come in. <laughs> 
Well, so I guess we're going to, we, we got to take a break here and go wrestle our dogs. Absolutely. Uh, and, well, and, hey, it's been great. Yeah. Uh, you take care. Keep your feet warm. I will. Good. And uh, you, you stay dry out there. Okay. All right, man. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye. Tom here. Thank you for listening to Getting to Third Space with Lamar and Tom. Remember to click on subscribe to be sure you get notices about new episodes. Getting to Third Space with Lamar and Tom is a production of Tenacious Change. Opinions and ideas expressed in this podcast are solely those of Lamar Roth and Tom Klaus. And we'd like to hear your opinions and ideas too. You can leave us a voice message on Spotify, or you can email us at the addresses found in the show notes. Also, in the show notes, you can find links to some of the things we talked about today, so you can check them out for yourself. Until next time, keep moving toward third space.